All right. So let's talk about a bit of an unlikely family, the Loraci or Laurel family. So the Laurel family is defined mostly by having very simple, alternately arranged leaves that have smooth edges. They're usually very shiny, um, kind of glossy, maybe waxy. They're kind of your classic plant leaf. If you think about a stereotypical plant leaf that you might recreate um, a fake plant so that people can have a fake house plant. A lot of times they're representing something that might be in the Loraceae or one of the similar um, closely related families. They're generally in tr tr shrub or tree form um, and they have flowers with six petals, although the petals are highly reduced, as you can see here in this image of a flower of a Loraceous plant. They have six stamens, as you can see. Each anther of that stamen, which is shown here, has six segments to it, and they um, have four flaps that pop open in order to release the pollen, which is unique among plants. There is one pistil, um, and the fruit is known as a droop, um, which is also a fruit type in the Rosaceae, but it's not the only fruit type of the Rosaceae. These guys only produce droops which are kind of like berries, except there is a single seed in a droop. Um, one genus of this family is actually a parasitic vine, so it doesn't have leaves or roots, but its flower and fruit are, you know, the same. There are some plants that, I, like I said earlier, will, you know, kind of tap into other plants and parasitize them. So, the Loraceae is a bit of an interesting group. Many of them are evergreens, but not all. Many of them are in a tree form. And they have something called protandrony, where even though the plants are monoecious and you have male and female parts to the same flower, the male and female parts aren't active at the same time on a plant. This is a mechanism to prevent selfing or the movement of your own pollen to your stigmatic surface. So oftentimes you will have um, the flower open one day and it's producing pollen. Then it will close at night and the following day when it opens it will accept pollen from other plants and stop producing its own pollen. Sometimes those um, that sequence is reversed Avocado is um, special because when it does this, you have to um, have type A and type B avocados in order to get the fruits. Type A has the male parts open first, and type B has the female parts open first. And so if you only have all type A or only have all type B, you're not going to get pollination occurring. Um, insects pollinate the entire family um, of this plant, of these plants, all Loraceae are pollinated by insects. Animals disperse the seeds. The droops are non dehiscent They really are meant to be eaten by something so that the seed can pass through the digestive tract of the animal and disperse somewhere. Now, ground sloths were the main dispersing agent of the avocado, and they're extinct now. And so avocado only exists because we decided to cultivate them because we wanted to eat their fruits. Um, for the actual growing of these plants, you generally have to start them from seed because you can't get cuttings to root very easily from anything in this family. And so for avocados, if you want to have a particular type of avocado, you'll grow the seed but once that seedling reaches a certain size, you graft the desired avocado breed onto it so it makes the avocado fruits you want. And this avoids having to, um, one, worry about recombination of DNA, and two, worry about the inefficiency of rooting cuttings. Now, 
the Loraceae is found basically throughout the world in isolated patches. Um, none of them are in, our, in our Antarctica. And one of the characteristics of this family that's not seen with a lot of others is that they are oftentimes in hot spots where you have a forest that's almost entirely Loraceae and no other plant family or very few other plant families. And it's huge diversity of Loraceae. So you have a lot of Loraceae, but they're basically concentrated into little pacts. It's almost like all the Loraceous species that are out there are little pellets and habitats would be like a bean bag. And so you throw a bunch of bean bags around pretending that's the globe. And that's kind of how Lorace, the Loraceae spreads about, um, is distributed. Um, a lot of them are adapted to like high elevation forests where there's a lot of cloud cover and fog. Their leaves are perfect at handling excess moisture and a lot of um, dim light hitting them. Really well adapted family for that. So this is a primitive family. It is a dicot. It's now, you know, still an angiosperm and vascular plant. There are 50 genera in two subfamilies. One subfamily just has that genus of parasitic vines, only about seven species of those. We don't know a lot about the Loraceae in terms of how these 50 genera are related to one another. There's no major consensus right now on um, what the division of the Loraceae is. We know they're in the order Loralis, which is a very primitive group. Um, Magnoliales is the only extant order of angiosperm that is more primitive. Um, a lot of the members of these two groups have very commonly shared characteristics. And a final note on this is that Laurel is a common name that doesn't just apply to the Loraceae. We have things like Mountain Laurel and Sheep Laurel, Cherry Laurel. These are in different families. Mountain Laurel and Sheep Laurel are in the same family as Blueberry, which we're going to get into in a later semester. And Cherry Laurel is a cherry. It's in the Roseaceae. So we have a couple of different species we use for food. Avocado is the you know, blaringly obvious one. Bay laurel is a flavoring. Cinnamon is a spice. We're going to get to see some cinnamon later in our field trip. Camphor is a closely related laurel to cinnamon that kind of has similar uses and also has a medical importance. Um, something to note, avocado can have some um, cultural consequences. Mexico is one area where avocado is very easy to grow because it's part of the avocado's native range. Um, it's one of a few plants that can grow fairly well no matter where you are in Mexico. And so a lot of people who farm in Mexico farm avocados and it's a great source of money for them. However, drug cartels like to target farmers for this reason. And so they do a tactic in gang violence that's known as um, being a power muscle, where they basically say, if you don't pay us, we're going to come ransack your farm and we're going to, you know, damage things of yours. So give us money and we'll leave you alone. Um, which is highly illegal, but, you know, this is a drug cartel. And so there are some political problems with avocado production and... There have been some unethical things that um, both the United States and Mexico have kind of done to the avocado market, but that's not the scope of this. And so we're going to kind of just leave it at that. Mexico produces, you know, more than half of the avocados that are imported and exported around the world. And so sometimes when there is political unrest in Mexico, avocado prices go way up. And so, you know, this is one of the um, ways that a plant that is grown for food affects other aspects of our lives. Sassafras used to flavor Fruit Loops and some similar products. Um, 
before we kind of figure out how to synthesize the materials that the flavoring comes from. Um, this is sassafras over here. Sassafras is a very distinctive tree. Not all the leaves are going to look like this. I've actually seen sassafras that have leaves that look almost identical to that of spicebush here, but you could tell by the bark that it was sassafras and not spicebush. Variable tree, very interesting plant. It's one of those deciduous loraceous plants rather than most species that are evergreen. Um, spicebush swallowtails, Promethea moth, and a few other native lepidopterans feed on both spicebush and sassafras. And they have a good ornamental value. People like the scent of spicebush and, you know, kind of the insects and birds it attracts. Sassafras has really great fall color, and while the tree can get fairly large, it also stays kind of compact in terms of how it spreads, and it's commonly grown as an ornamental. People like these plants particularly for their gardens and their yards, and so this is a member of the Loraceae that we don't really eat, but we do use quite a bit. So this is the Laurel family. Again, it's not a huge family. Um, it's certainly not the tiniest family we're going to talk about, but it's not anywhere near the size of the previous things. But it does have some important species. Um, by the way, I don't know if anybody has ever heard of the Cinnamon Challenge. Please do not partake in the Cinnamon Challenge um, because it can make you very sick. Um, you are not <clears throat> meant to take in a large amount of cinnamon at once. It can cause a lot of problems for your um, throat and lungs and you don't want to do that. Um, generally, a good rule of thumb is if something is called a challenge, it's a very bad idea to do because people think it's funny to push themselves to a limit. Um, cinnamon is great when used appropriately. It is the main flavoring in carrot cake, and I love carrot cake, um, mostly because it incorporates a whole bunch of different plant families. It has the Loraceae in it. It has the Myrtaceae, I think. Um, it has the Orchidaceae, if you add vanilla. It has the um, Apiaceae. It has the um, rose AC if you add almond extract, and you know, it's just a really amazing thing. But cinnamon is really good for a lot of baking. I, I don't know how many people have never had cinnamon before. It's a wonderful thing. And cinnamon's actually really weird because it's not any part of the plant besides the bark of a tree that you are grinding up and using as a flavoring because the plant synthesizes defensive chemicals in its bark to prevent insects from laying eggs in the bark. And that's what we use to flavor things. And so it's highly valued and we're going to see some cinnamon later. So that's a little ricey for everybody.